Okay, uh, welcome everyone for this uh, third session in this uh, wonderful symposium uh, that we have on the state of nature. Uh, thank you to the Maxwell Bhavan and to Ranjit for the for organizing this uh, this event that brings so many very very interesting minds together and uh, brings in a certain dialogue. Uh, in these very kind of strained times that allows us to take ourselves beyond where we are and to, you know, add a lot to our own uh, processes uh, of contemplation. Uh, this, uh, this session is called Reorienting Group Relationships with Place and Change. And we will uh, have our presenters talking about communities and resilience, uh, particularly in the context of uh, climate change and sustainability and uh, such uh, themes. Uh, may I first make uh, introductions to all the three uh, panelists and then I'd say a few things and then invite each of them to make their presentations. Uh, I begin with uh, our first panelist, uh, Prem Chandavarkar. Prem Chandavarkar is the managing partner of CNT Architects, an award-winning and widely published architectural practice based in Bengaluru, India. He received his training from the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, uh, in '78, and went on to do a research-based master's degree in architecture from the University of Oregon. Uh, in the United States, where he wrote a thesis on the linguistic analogy in architectural theory. He is a former executive director of Shrushti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Bengaluru and is an academic advisor and guest faculty at Indian and International Colleges of Architecture. In 2016, he was the curator of the Centenary National Convention of the Indian Institute of Architects on the theme, Imagining the Indian City. Besides its design practice at CNT, uh, Prem writes, lectures, and blogs on architecture, urbanism, philosophy, politics, education, environment, art, and cultural studies. Uh, welcome, Prem, uh, to the evening. Our next speaker is Anupama Kundu. Uh, Anupama graduated from the University of Mumbai in 1989 and, reserved, uh, and received her PhD degree from TU Berlin in 2008. Her research-oriented practice started in 1990 in Oroville and generated people-centric architecture based on spatial and material research uh, for low environmental impact while being socio-economically beneficial. Her body of works was recently exhibited as a solo show, Taking Time, at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art, Denmark, uh, in 2021. Anupama has taught architecture and urban management at various international universities, strengthening her expertise in rapid urbanization and climate change related developments, and was the professor and was the Davenport visiting professor at Yale uh, in 2020. Uh, she is currently prof professor at Potsdam School of Architecture, Germany. Uh, Anupama is the recipient of the 2021 RIBA Charles Jenks Award for her contribution to architectural theory. Uh, the recipient of the 2021 RI <coughs> uh, the 2021 August Perret Prize for Architectural Technology, and the 2021 Building Sense Now Global Award of the German Sustainable Building Council. Her studios are based in Berlin and Pune and Pondicherry. Kundu's rigorous research and experimentation in new materiality for architecture is the result of questioning basic assumptions, construction habits that humanity has adopted during long processes of industrialization. Rather than focusing on shortage, she sought abundance through investing in human resources and human resourcefulness. 
such as ingenuity, time, skills, care, and a sense of community. The act of building produces knowledge, just as the resulting knowledge produces buildings. Welcome, Anupama, to the, to the evening today. Our third speaker is Parag Tandel, who is a Mumbai-based artist with a post-diploma in creative sculpture from the MS University in Baroda and a diploma in sculpture and modeling from Sir JJ School of Art. Tandel's solo exhibitions include Pregnant Room, Pregnant Room 1, 2008, and Pregnant Room 2, 2010, both showcased at the Pandol in Mumbai, Chronicle at Turk, and Auto Polisphilia, curated by Nupur Desai at Sudarshan Art Gallery, Pune, in 2018. He has also been part of various group shows across India, including All Canaries Bear Watching by Premji Shacharya, 2022, Fragile Kinship, curated by Shaunak uh, Mehbubani, Swiss Embassy, Delhi, Making Space, curated by Saloni Doshi, 2019, the Art of Drawing, 2011, The Guild, and Avagard, 20, uh, uh, 2009, Threshold Art Gallery, Delhi, amongst others. Some of his public art projects include Confluence, uh, MWN, curated by Sara Emmert, 2021, Surviving SQ, uh, Suna Parata Initiative, 2020, Tandale Fund of Archives, Pop-Up Museum, of Fisher Folk in Mumbai, Encounters, Daily Rations, curated by Art Oxygen 2017, Geographies of Consumptions, curated by the Mohile Parikh Center 2012. Additionally, he has participated in residencies at the BCS Taiwan, the Piramal Art Residency, Space 118, Mumbai, and Sandharb, Partapur, Rajasthan. Uh, Welcome, Parag, and I am happy that he is with us here today. Uh, so, if, uh, if if I may just kind of uh, lay out some uh, thoughts before I call the uh, speakers to make their presentations. Uh, let me just say this, that here is a proposition. All of us, you and I, uh, especially those who will live for another three decades or so, will probably die as climate change refugees. Will we meet again in around 2050, or will we all be kind of scattered as chaff, seeking straws to hang on to, with survival as priority, rather than have the privilege of contemplating art, or poetics, or even the state of nature? Consider this. The Paris Agreement to stabilize temperature rise to 1.5 degrees uh, has probably come around to thinking that this is not going to happen. A rise to 1.7 degrees will lead to extreme weather events. The disasters that will follow with even greater temperature rises are difficult to contemplate, but it is very likely that we will be witness uh, to them. Uh, Henry David Thoreau has put it very uh, nicely, he says, what is the use of a fine house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? Uh, the impacts of climate change are not felt evenly. The threats are greatest to those with the least resources, those who in fact have had the least impact on climate change. These are the people who will be disproportionately affected. As climate change worsens, disasters uh, of all sorts, people will migrate away from such climatic hotspots where there are rising seas, stronger storms, and deadly heat waves to places they consider safer, putting an unsustainable burden on the new sites of occupation, causing unforeseen challenges, both social and political. Uh, the tropics, I think, are particularly vulnerable. Uh, it is estimated that by around 2050, there will be 143 million internal climate change migrants just in the continents of Africa, Asia, and South America. Uh, in his novel Dune, Frank Herbert puts it, 
quite succinctly. He says, beyond a critical point within a finite space, freedom diminishes as numbers increase. This is as true of humans as it is of gas molecules in a sealed flask. The human question is not how many can possibly survive within the system, but what kind of existence is possible for those who so survive. Uh, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change has already identified climate change as the cause of weakened food security. Droughts, floods and extreme temperatures directly affect food and freshwater resources. Crop supplies are directly affected by extreme weather events. This is bound to lead to a reduction in availability and consequently price rise directly affecting the poor. Malnutrition and stunted growth is the inevitable outcome of situations like this. We are also going to be presented with a variety of vulnerable landscapes. We do know that only 2.5% of the Earth's water is fresh water. Much of it is locked up in glaciers and ice caps. Groundwater provides about 50% of consumed water, but is very difficult to monitor. Rivers provide billions of, uh, uh, provide water to billions, but climate change can affect the discharge of rivers and cause shortages. And of course, as we have seen in the earlier presentations also, there is the issue of pollution of rivers itself. Uh, we are looking at, you know, situations of epic upheaval. Climate health, human health, and ecosystem health are all interconnected. Uh, Ruth Padel mentioned earlier a beautiful phrase from Darwin calling these th uh, interconnectedness a tangled bank. Uh, but climate change is resulting in changes that are happening too rapidly for systems to adopt, weakening resiliences of all its components. With contracting mindsets and deliberate ecocides, what kind of reorientation do we have with place? I do hope that our panelists will talk about the implications uh, of these many uh, uh, changes, what these implications will be for architecture, urbanism, as well as the uh, questions of habitat, labor, livelihood, and culture. Uh, I think I can immediately now ask for our panelists to start making their presentations. I hope what I have said will be a little bit of a provocation for them as well. And I look forward to their uh, thoughts on uh, these uh, topics. So may I call on, uh, oh, we have uh, Ratish who has joined us as well. Uh, wonderful, welcome Ratish. Uh, Ratish is a, a, a conservation architect based in Delhi and has been involved with the uh, projects of the Aga Khan for many, many years, including, if I'm correct, the Humayun's tomb uh, restoration. So welcome uh, to, the, uh, to the conversation. Uh, yes, may I request uh, Prem to make his presentation? Thank you so much. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, let me just share my presentation. Yeah, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, I'm going to focus on the community that I belong to. How should architectural practice respond to a crisis of nature that's at the planetary scale? And if I define the prevailing practice model, it is highly personality centric. When you name the cutting edge, you tend to name personalities. And those personalities are seen as the source of meaning. And practice is just treated as a vehicle for the personality to express themselves. And since one is dealing with intangibles, one needs to validate socially and peer review is seen as the best mode of validation. So architects tend to judge themselves about whether the work wins design awards, whether it gets published in reputed journals or books. 
whether it's discussed seriously in the schools of architecture and so on. And these all mechanisms of peer review and it's bred a self-referential culture in the profession where architects are really designing for other architects and the constituencies and ecology, <clears throat> ecologies they're meant to serve are not seen with clarity. And creativity, especially in recent times, is judged by how radical it is rather than its positive impact on inhabitation, life, and ecology. So how does one deal with sustainable sustainability goals, especially when many of them need to be global in scale? I'd like to put this in context about what the state is doing. And I use Daniel Hausnott's paper, The Environmental State and the Glass Ceiling of Transformation as an entry point. And he says we've had till now an environmental state which is looking at local ecological loops, like does, uh, is there contamination of air, water, soil, etc. And the response has been to manage the supply side through regulatory frameworks and enforcement mechanisms, pollution control boards, etc. Uh, all the time making sure the underlying economic model is not disturbed. But we need to move to a green state which is looking at planetary scale ecological loops and that the, the scale of the crisis requires that both the supply side and the demand side are dealt with and supply side regulation is supplemented by changes to lifestyle and consumption patterns. So one may need to constrain economic growth. So Hausnost uh, looks at this from the purpose of the state and there have been three historical purposes which have been to maintain internal order, protection, external competition, and to raise revenue to carry out the above two purposes. Two additional features have been added with a modern democratic state. One is that governance has to be legitimized through the uh, uh, protocols of democracy. And there is a social contract which grants this legitimation on the understanding that public welfare will be promoted through, through economic growth. And the glass ceiling is that climate change's necessary demand for frugality contradicts the social contract based on economic growth. And you need people to change, but planetary ecology involves complex loops traversing large dimensions of space and time. So they're non-linear. You can't tell someone if you make this change, this specific tangible benefit will follow. So it's very difficult to incentivize change. So Hausnos connects this to Habermas's definition of the legitimation crisis, where he says we all have a life world, uh, a notion of the world that we all share so that we can live together. And there is a system that uh, manages this life world that uh, pulls things together and both need to be sustainable. And Habermas was largely looking at the political system and the two have to be in balance, the life world and the system except now we also have to look at an ecological system and what the ecological system demands is not what the political system does. But when we look at changes, we tend to focus more on the overall system sustainability, whereas we also need to be working on the life world side of it. If we need to change the demand side and actually it's actually the life world side, which is far more gener generative. If you look at the political system of democracy we have now, that came through life world changes of some early thinkers in the age of enlightenment. So I look at what we should do to reform practice, the life world of practice. And there's been a standard response on various measures that practice needs to live up to, but these are not really sufficient because one, they don't deal with bottlenecks like the self-referential culture of the profession or that it's based on individualized assertions, which are more rhetorical rather than evidence-based. And it is still dealing only with the supply side. It doesn't look at a change in life world. So recognizing that one has, can only start with one sphere of influence rather than one sphere of concern, I share the beginnings of a personal exploration about how one can change the life world of practice. Looking at a change in consciousness at three levels, the person, the practice, and the project. So starting with the person, and I start with William Cronon's uh, talk about how nature is not a scientific fact or their conception of it is socially mediated. 
And we tend to view it with wonder primarily when it is wilderness. And within the city, it's considered an aesthetic spectacle for our enjoyment and not an ecological force to be respected. And Cronon asks, can we look at the weed in the crack of a pavement, the shrub in our backyard with the same wonder given to the primal forest or majestic ocean? Because really they're all part of the life, same life system and they're all equally worthy of wonder. So starting with that point, one looks at the self and realizes that the self is embedded in a world. And initially we have a, a body which establishes a structural and sensory boundary through which we know the world. And when we are born, the boundary of consciousness is very closely aligned with that structural and sensory boundary. But we have to deal with the world, so we need to expand our boundary of consciousness to encompass some part of the world. And when we are children, as Jean Piaget has pointed out, we use our body to do that. So we, so we pull, uh, for example, our toe into the, our mouth or a, put a toy in the mouth and realize the difference in sensation and therefore the, relance, the relationship between the body and the world. And as we become adults, we expand that further out as we interact with people and build shared definitions of the world. So we develop senses, a sense of community, a sense of identity and a worldview. But what is demanded now is an even, even further shift outwards to bring in ecological harmony, transcendence, because we have to feel a part of realities that are far greater than we are. And we need to develop the personal mastery to achieve this. And this requires inculcating a sense of wonder. And one really doesn't have to look beyond our own body for that, because it's quite amazing that we are these bun this bundle of blood and bone and skin and gut and muscle and so on, all entities bound by uh, physical law. Yet that same bundle can dream, ideate, sing, dance, love, wonder, and so much more. So there is a spirit within which is quite amazing. And one can start with that and see how that spirit unites with the wider spirit. And that is essentially how we live in wonder. And we access that by realizing life beyond us is alive. It's not inert. And I use as an example, Neruda's wonderful poem, an excerpt from his poem, Ode to the Sea where he says here on the island, the sea and how much sea can't contain itself at every moment, says yes, then no, says no, 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 says yes in blue, in foam at a gallop, says no and no. It can't stay still. My name is sea, it repeats, smashing on a rock, unable to convince it, then with seven green tongues of seven green hounds, of seven green tigers, of seven green seas. It goes all over, kissing and soaking the rock, beating its breast, repeating its name. So you see how poetic sensibility uh, realizes that the world around is fully alive and there's a spirit in the world that, is, that unites with the wonderful spirit within us. And our rationality sanitizes our, our, this out of all of us. And the way one connects with this is not through an intellectual understanding, but it's an embodied practice. So just as the musician continuously practice repeatedly day after day till his or her consciousness, the consciousness of the piano, the consciousness of the music, of the music merge into a unity. So we have to uh, build these practices in our daily life. So I'll end this section with a quotation from the dancer choreographer, Martha Graham who said, I believe that we learn by practice, whether it means to learn to dance by practicing dancing or to learn to live by practicing living, the principles are the same. In each, it is the performance of a dedicated, precise set of acts, physical or intellectual, from which comes shape of achievement, a sense of one's being, the satisfaction of spirit. One becomes in some area an athlete of God. Practice means to perform over and over again in the face of all obstacles, some act of vision, of faith, of desire. Practice is a means of inviting the perfection desired. So moving on to consciousness and the levels at which we encounter the world, and one has to start with the person that our consciousness is, 
and we come up with third person accounts and objects, what we call reality. But practice is a process of second person mediation where we engage with others. So if the first person is the person and the pro a product is the project we produce, the second person mediation is our practice. But we tend to treat practice as just this neutral system to achieve what the first person personality wants to achieve. And then when the protocols of the discipline and education come in, the first person is also sanitized as being subjective and um, systems of knowledge that are taught uh, uh, revolve solely around the product or primarily around the product. But if we bring all three together and we realize that they're embedded within social and cultural networks and natural networks, we realize the crucial role of this second person mediation because through it, we validate who we are. We know ourselves in the way we are called upon by another. Through our interactions, we validate our tacit uh, knowledge of reality, notions such as love, wonder, and beauty when we see them echoed in another. And through that, we can reify them in the art that we create. And it is this entire process that gives us our authenticity. So we need to think about what the realm of practice is. So, I propose that we look at the practice as a place contextually embedded in internal and external social networks, where we validate our first person and tacit pers perspectives. We produce value-based reification in the form of the art we create. And because we are in networks, we create a critical mass of people on new perspectives, which we cannot do as individuals, which uh, rapidly spreads information. So best of breed practice can become an all of breed practice. And these lateral connections offer benchmarks on small steps towards complex goals, which helps with the nonlinear aspect of the, you know, the challenge we're facing. And above all, it creates the capacity for emergence, which is that through these networks, new possibilities emerge, which might not have been a property of the initial system, but become fundamental as we evolve. So moving finally to the consciousness of projects. And ever since the profession started, it has placed the project's consciousness in a reality far greater than the project. So whether it is a notion of divine beauty of the Renaissance or the social revolution of 20th century modernism or the glorification of technology as a liberating force <clears throat> or postmodernism's uh, claim to capture the spirit of culture on today's Instagram influenced world the, the out of the box formalism is treated as created is uh, treated as the epitome of human creativity. But can we look at something that is much more restrained and modest that is within the, the project itself? And I'm very intrigued by the philosopher Mark Rowland's proposal of what he calls Rilkean memory, which is derived from something that the German poet Rainer Maria Rilke wrote. And the passage he quotes. And yet it is not enough to have memories. You must be able to forget them when they are many. And you must have the immense patience to wait until they return. For the memories themselves are not important. Only when they have changed into our very blood, into glance and gesture, and are nameless, no longer to be distinguished from ourselves. Only then can it happen that in some very rare are the first word of a poem arises in their midst and goes forth from them. So he's talking about a memory that is highly embodied in our very blood, a glance and gesture. It's, it's through a practice that it slowly absorbs so that it's in a part of our body. But he says the Rilkean memory is also affective and he quotes Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows for this. We others who have long lost the most subtle of the physical senses have not even the proper terms to express an animal's intercommunication with his surroundings, living or otherwise, and have only the word smell, for instance, to include the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose of the animal night and day, summoning, warning, inciting, repelling. It was one of those mysterious fairy calls from out of the void that reached Mole in the darkness, making him tingle through and through with its very familiar appeal, while as yet he could not clearly remember what it was. 
He stopped dead in his tracks, his nose searching hither and thither in its efforts to recover the fine filament, the telegraphic current that had so strongly moved him. A moment and he had caught it again, and with it this time came recollection in its full flood. Om, that is what they meant, those caressing appeals, those soft touches wafted through the air, those invisible hands pulling and tugging all one way. So there's an emotional bond that's created, an effective bond with, the, with one's surroundings and one's memory is both embodied and, and uh, uh, embedded within, within one's surroundings. And so, and this is something that I think Primo Levi uh, talked about in his uh, book, Other People's Trades, in an essay on his own home, where he cited a technique used by the orators of ancient Rome who didn't have the use of paper that we take for granted and use the architecture of the space they were speaking as a, as a mnemonic device. So the entrance door would stand for the first point, the column next to it for the next point, etc. And Levi refers to this technique and says, it would never work for me in my own home for every corner is already occupied by authentic memories, which would interfere with the fictitious techniques that uh, fictitious memories that this technique demands. So, one has, so this is a very Rilkean perspective of the Rilkean memory perspective that one, you know, lets memories lose and they sort of get absorbed into one's surroundings and into one's bodies till one is bo bonded with that surrounding. And Levi says that my uh, home is like a second skin to me. I can think of more beautiful skins, but I can't think about giving up this one. And it's not just the memories that one writes. There are memories written by others that we also receive, like John O'Donoghue talks about the memory of landscape. And he says, one of the things that humans have done, especially in Western consciousness, is that we have hijacked all the primary mystical qualities for the human mind. And we have made this claim that only the human self has soul, that everything else is de-souled. I think that is an awful travesty because landscape has a soul and a presence and landscape living in the mode of silence is always wrapped in seamless prayer. And actually this notion of receiving such signals uh, from the landscape has been shown in recent research in neurosciences where uh, the brain responds very dif differently when one is among uh, in the midst of nature. So one has to establish these bonds. So one would look at the dimensions of the project as consisting of one, the inhabitation as a primary source of meaning. So not from the creative personality, but you lay the frame for someone to then appropriate what you have done and then endure it with meaning through inhabitation. And how do you shape the project as a fount for Rilkean memory? For that, the architect needs to seek a personal mastery of four things integrity, and this is integrity of space. Uh, as Louis Kahn said, a plan is a society of rooms. So space having an integrity by which one can hold the map of where you are in your mind and know your, your position on this earth. Uh, it's also integrate, integrity of uh, inhabitation, integrity of ecology. And to do this, one needs to develop an empathy. One needs to, through a rigorous daily practice, develop an empathy with inhabitation and with nature. And one cannot get trapped by tired repetitions of the familiar for doing this. One has to offer some in emancipation, some new possibilities of being, uh, not in the social revolution that 20th century modernism anticipated, but perhaps more in the spirit that Rudolf Steiner suggested uh, when he said that the artist does not ha first have an idea and then translate that into a sensory phenomenon, the artist raises the sensory phenomenon to a level of an idea by envisioning an arrangement that releases the spiritual content of material reality. So what, what Steiner is said, really suggesting is a notion of aura, that an aura, the aura is defined as a spirit that emanates from a person or thing. So one seeks to create a design that releases the aura of inhabitation, the aura of nature. And what one is really doing is one is working in the realm of the spirit to do this. That what we call the real world is actually the real world of the spirit. We know it in our body in the fact that this body bound by physical law can still dance and sing and do so many amazing things. 
and therefore, and we seek its resonance and we embed the memory of all of that, both within ourselves and in our surroundings. So in what we do, we open the gateway to transcendence. Thank you. Thank you, Prem. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation uh, on, on several different ideas, especially your notions of practice in the changing world. Uh, I have some questions which I'm sure we can uh, talk about once all the presentations are done. Uh, may I not now call upon Anupama Kundu to make her presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh was uh, really inspiring to hear both of you and your input so far. I'm just going to check if my screen, uh, is the screen visible already? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh, uh, just excuse me, I've got, I have to escape it, sorry. Um, hmm. So, um, my images are not going to be related to what I'm going to say. Uh, I have just added some images uh, since, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know um, what I've been, uh, you know, uh, you know to, to, to give the, you know, to illustrate my point, sometimes a picture is more than a thousand words. So I've got some of the images of my investigations in the background. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank you all for having me here, and I really look forward to the discussion. Part. I want to just uh, throw in a couple of uh, points that I would like to um, hear from you also about. And in, in the uh, spirit of what uh, Prem just uh, spoke about, this last point, particularly the aura and how the vision um, radiates, things that, that come from beyond the, our knowledge. It comes from imagination as well. And I, I would like to um, talk about um, the state of nature by examining the through this quality that humans have of imagination and producing visions, you know, to, to see how the state of human nature is and the resulting built environment that we have created and how what we make makes us, you know, so uh, to be aware of uh, all the struggles we have, but also the potential we have as humans, um, as an evolving society, but also as the human being in, evolves in nature that also evolves, we are in this transition. So I want to speak from that point of view. Um, I want to actually um, start by uh, by saying that you know that that yes the state of human nature is affect I mean is affecting the state of nature and that what we create is uh, affecting us back. So, uh, uh, one of the visible signs of this is the rapidly transforming built environment in which we are all now. And if you just look at it, how it used to be not so long ago, that no matter where humans had intervened and built their habitat, there was a very direct relationship to the local local, local materials and the, the, the question of materiality and the way we are dealing with um, the production of our post-industrial built environment has that kind of a large disconnect. So I want to bring that up um, for discussion and also, um, you know, to, to realize that the, you know, jumping to today's situation, we, because of this, of the new habits of construction that we have uh, produced where we are no longer sourcing materials or skills from the spot where we are building architecture, we, um, there is a sense of disconnect of place that we are all as architects concerned about. But there is also a loss of human scale in the, through the production processes and therefore in the products as well. 
So there is a kind of sense of, um, you know, loss of identity and all of those questions. But, um, but one of the things that in, in, in our discussions with uh, climate change related questions, um, we, I mean, one of the things we can notice is that the materiality, the material habits of our times is, is definitely problematic in, in not only in environmental terms, but also in social and um, economic terms. I mean, the kind of um, the so-called modern methods of producing architecture has, um, you know, with the growing um, yeah, economically motivated um, factors, there's this kind of big separation between professional builders on one hand and the ones who use the built environment. And so not only is it socially and environmentally destabilizing, it is out of reach for the bulk of the population to have the same kind of thing. And so there are these, the urban form is always um, interspersed with two, I mean, as if people live in two different cities, those who can afford that type of product and the growing bulk of the population who cannot, and this is a worldwide phenomenon, uh, but, but at one point, I mean, architecture, I mean, I see architecture as a stage on which all human stories are lived out. And this stage, which was um, constructed practically by everyone formally, is now mostly outsourced to professionals. And there is, through this kind of uh, process, there is a growing um, disconnect on many levels. And, that, and then there is a sense of loss of engagement. That is also something that that really is a big concern. That there is a uh, there is a growing apathy and a loss and, and a sense that, uh, that one is overwhelmed by the whole uh, mess, as it were. So one doesn't know where to begin. So um, the way I have been looking at materiality, because no matter whether it's a high tech uh, product or a low tech, uh, whether it's um, clay from the spot that you use, or if it's aluminium and steel, all materials come from the ground. They come from a physical place upon the earth. And then humans engage with those materials through investing more energy, whether it's human energy or coal, whatever it is. And, and then that results in the building culture. And so, so there is a, uh, for me, the idea of materiality was uh, not so interesting from the point of view of purely the external material itself, whether it's a high embodied energy material or not. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is uh, how humans engage with materials. So this has been the most important, uh, um, you know, way of understanding materials how humans look at materials and how they deal with them. So I guess, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, I do believe that what we make makes us. And it's very, very important to see um, what will be, uh, what our lives will be as a result of how we made our homes or whether we have been active or passive or whether we, understood or just accepted and so on, whether we participated or didn't, and then whether we relate or we don't. So because, uh, and therefore, when you talk about materials only externally, like many of the green building guidelines and so on, what happens is that, you know, I, I mean, there is, a, there is a way of looking at only the energy that goes into a material of how, what distance, these are all these rational aspects, but but the thing is, I've been looking at materials from the point of view of human resources. I found that the more we realize that the materials are finite, the more we realize that the human resources, as opposed to natural resources, are infinite. The amount of love and care we can apply, our intelligence, our muscles, uh, uh, you know, our engagement. Everything is, is the human resources and human resourcefulness is actually infinite. So if we were to use human resources more proactively, then we would 
in my opinion, would uh, save a lot, a lot of natural resources. A lot of the over expenditure has to do with our non engagement. And here I would like to um, just read actually a few lines from what I wrote uh, uh, for a paper that is published by the Norman Foster Foundation. I just like to quote, uh, you know, I'm talking about the, the uh, neglected uh, human resource of time and taking time that my whole exhibition recently was about. I want to read a little paragraph here, bear with me. The answers to the kind of questions I listed earlier may lie in re-examining those habits of mind and body that humanity has adopted during the long process of industrialization. Foremost among these are the notions of time and its scarcity. If time is perceived to be scarce, then it follows that the rational professional would prefer to specify pre-designed standardized materials and components and outsource to experts those tasks they believe they aren't qualified to handle. The pre that preference, once it becomes a reflexive habit, has pernicious effects on the choice of form and materials. These effects are a consequence of the growing and unquestioned disconnect between what might have been possible with a little more thought versus what ends up happening when design decisions are effectively outsourced to someone with a standardized product or a preferred solution. The point is simple. We think we don't have time, so we don't take the time to think. That mindset has avoidable consequences. So I have uh, uh, produced a lot of strategies over the last 30 years to deal with how to avoid that mindset and its consequences. And, uh, uh, but uh, I want to just add one more line there, uh, that our time is not an expense to be minimized. There was this notion of time is money, but I think rather it is a wasting resource that we should be eager to employ. It is the misguided disuse of our time and therefore our intelligence that leads to wasteful overconsumption of finite natural resources and a lower quality of life. The idea is to imaginatively and purposefully use our time to create an abundance that can benefit all. So um, one of the um, you know, uh, approaches when we take the time to think is you realize that if you, if you apply those kind of free human resources like time, you realize that you, your own gaze shifts and you realize that instead of looking for scarcity or looking at the scarcity of things, you can look that everywhere you go, everywhere on earth, there is an abundance of something, any material that's under you. Uh, you know, if it's a desert, you don't have to look for wood. There is something, even people build with ice. So there is things and then there are abundance to be there is abundance also in knowledge and skills and all of that so if one focuses on abundance instead of scar scarcity one can begin with unleashing first and foremost what we as humans have as resources and we in india with a high population we have that many human resources i um I used to ask myself from day one when i was already before i graduated looking at the built environment around me. What is the point of doing efficiently things that need not be done at all? So I think that a lot of things we are anxious to produce are probably not even required. And they are not all those expensive apartments we uh, um, seek to have are in the end, not even in that sense satisfying. And uh, so I looked at, I, I began my, um, by practice, by wandering around and noticing that the materiality begins right in the beginning on how, not, not when we start specifying uh, materials for producing architecture, but how do building materials get made in the first place? And what is the relationship between humans who live in a particular area and have interacted over generations with the immediacy of those materials? And, for instance, uh, old brick kilns, they grow, they take the thinnings of, you know, casuarina, etc. that they grow so that those can uh, fuel in the right season, the brick kiln rest of the time, the same people are producing, doing either this plantations or they are producing food, rice mostly because it's the, the kind of, um, you know, um, thing that grows there. So there's a whole ecosystem and there, there are different human activities and engagements of which building 
the production of the building, uh, the built environment is only a part. The moment you see it in isolation, everything else collapses like in a Jenga tower where you take off the wrong piece. And uh, similarly, all of these, you know, lime kilns and communities who only did that whole day are easily overnight uh, being compromised, I mean, being completely uh, cut off because of thoughtless prescription of Portland cement because of the way we are taught architecture and so on. And to use materials today, which are literally from the, below the ground, is uh, for many people considered to be much more expensive. Whereas in, uh, you know, so this, there are all, all these economies are also something to be looked at, I feel, uh, to look at not only in money terms, but to look at human resources and human participation in the way resources are being exchanged. And I think, you know, these are the type of things that I um, began my inquiries with and landed up producing. So I think um, in conclusion, I would say that if one were to, looking at all the difficulties and challenges that we as humans are facing, not only now at every point, whether it's COVID or a new thing will come up or climate change or whatever it is, the thing that could save human beings is, uh, is, is, is not necessarily past knowledge. I think the future is advancing and coming at such an exponential pace uh, towards us that uh, what, what has always um, the attributes that uh, humans can rely on rather than feeling like victims of, uh, of circumstances is, I think, knowing, acknowledging that past knowledge will not suffice in navigating our way forward. It is rather imagination, human imagination um, that, that will, uh, these are attributes that have, uh, these are also the same qualities that um, bring about evolution in, in nature. The, the imagination, the willingness to try out new things, that means experimentation, and uh, being able to adapt. So I think with these kind of human qualities and on top of it, optimism and goodwill and actually a sense of collaboration, uh, I think that's how the future that we have, uh, we see ahead of us can be navigated. And of course the future cannot be known. Uh, but um, whether we feel, look at the adventure or the security, you know, it's, it's an attitude thing. And I think in, in the production of the built environment, if we look upon the challenge for us right now is to look, look at materiality in a new way. And in order to rethink materiality, I would, um, I would like us to uh, remind ourselves that human beings are uh, yeah, imaginative and able to experiment and create new things so we can develop human gen ingenuity and to see that and remember that we humans are part of nature and nature's experiment and of the grand adventure of evolution. Thank you. Thank you, Anupama, for your presentation. Uh, I would definitely like to uh, have a more detailed conversation with you on how you have used uh, the thought processes behind the ideas of materials uh, in your own work, uh, maybe with uh, some examples, but perhaps we can include that uh, in the conversation. Also, the idea of uh, human resourcefulness uh, being in abundance as compared to, uh, you know, anything that is that is uh, that does not have such a lot of uh, um, amount of you know presence amongst us. Uh, may I now call upon uh, Parag to make his presentation? First of all, uh, thank you uh, to Ravi and uh, Ranjit, also Amruta and Gautam Institute for 
uh, inviting me uh, for inviting me and uh, uh, this is the first time uh, I'm presenting and uh, it's uh, honor to be here actually so before starting uh, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to read a uh, 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 one mind map uh, which I had written before uh, the project. So I'll start with that. Salt of ocean, salt as portion, moon attached in midst of ocean. Water in pan will turn into salt soon. They disappeared. The salt pan into woods. Soon I will transform into concrete woods. Sir Sun God is meeting Mr. Moon to discuss about mysterious dark matters. Moon, dark water is not listening to me, sir. Sun, ask barnacles and corals to clean. Ask mangrove forest to clean. Ask water to clean water. Ask clouds to clean faster. You know, sir, they are all shellfish. Mr. Moon, is there anything fishy going on? Then ask fish to clean it. Sir, we should, clean, we should call fisherman. He is the only hope. I am no more fisherman. Stop, you fool little moon, or I shall disconnect your shine, which is mine. Mr. Moon, this is time of extinction. Mr. Fishyman, I have task for you. We need your help to dry the fishes. Save them all as much as you can, as soon as possible. Mr. Moon, call his sisters. They can do this soon. Mr. Moon, we are nearly doomed. Enlighten them, or I will frighten them. I am frightened, sir. Fruit of Eden had given them knowledge of West. Ask Lord Vishnu to take away knowledge. He was base of all resources during Samudra Manthana. Take all resources back. Sir, what about me? Mr. Moon, we need to save everything before Lord Shiva, the destroyer, destroys everything. Sir, we can ask Lord Brahma, the creator, to create once again. Call ocean god. We need to sit on table and have discussion about dark waters. But sir, we need to reboot again. My dear moon, process has already begun. Disengage everything. Everything? Yes, everything. And mummify every bit of it. Mummification? Yes, my dear and restart the system, but save all memories. So I'll start with, uh, this is Attanay the Kavachnay is, sorry, Attanay the Kavachnay is a very uh, popular saying in our Koli uh, community. And uh, it is, it is like, uh, it is uh, usually uh, when you are in middle of the ocean, middle of the ocean and storm is there and you have to quickly take a decision. Now or never. I feel that we will finish. This is a time more than uh, till people are saying till 2050, but in 30 years or we don't have time. This is for us. The climate change is for us. Either to wipe, wipe it, wipe, go from here, all vanished off, and or change from inside. So, next slide. So, I did one uh, project in uh, 2017, uh, which was curated by Art Oxygen. Uh, it, it was part of daily ration, encounter daily, uh, daily ration curated by uh, Leandre D'Souza. So, uh, 
uh, one side lies moon and one other side lies the bread. So you know, I'll tell short uh, story. I went to eat fish, which is very popular in Koli community. So you know, usually if you go to during new moon in Koli houses, you will find crabs, and during uh, full moon you will not find crabs. So why? Because uh, you, uh, during new moon the tides are very low, and during full moon the tides are very high. So marine species have to struggle a lot during full moon. So they lose a lot of fats, and during new moon they are very okay. It's like they don't have to struggle. So they develop more fats, and those fats are nutritious, and which is very important. So. i am not telling why moon is important in for koli people god is there but this is this is the logic and from there the project starts so there are few uh, 15 uh, women in my fishing village who had started uh, uh, 10 years back they have started uh, making rotis they uh, their husbands have left fishing business and they, the women have taken over uh, the homes and uh, they started selling rotis and if you go to a uh, whole uh, all seven islands whole mumbai in each kolivada there are 250 koli kolivadas and you will find at least 7 to 15 uh, women in each kolivada who is selling rotis rice rotis and and this is very famous in bombay fish they eat with fish uh, fish curry actually ambat what we call So next slide. So these are the women's eleven, uh, uh, sorry, twelve. One one is missing. Actually, she he was not there. So next slide. So uh, I collaborated with them and I uh, I arranged a, a dry fish recipe competition and largest roti competition. So drying in the sense that uh, uh, loss something we are losing that was that was the context i used and largest roti was like to bring them together i wanted to uh, uh, have some tangible relationship so that's why i arranged the competition next next so these are the recipes uh dry fish recipes they bought uh, next slide so during the course of this project uh, what i uh, we found two uh, recipes which were uh, uh which were lost and which uh, new generations were not knowing so i'm not going to tell you the whole uh, pro why project was there and what was there i'm just going to flip the slides and tell what was going on you can think wh what you want to uh, uh, reflect or something next project next slide so so i uh, so i asked them to uh, uh, write the recipes on the paper and these are the hand written recipes uh, this is video i think you just and i drew uh, drawings of loss it's not playing here here this side so dry fish uh, i took dry fish because uh, usually you don't find dry fish in any of the hotels restaurants anywhere it is cooked mostly is 100% it is cooked in uh, holy homes so drying was like uh, uh, contextually if you see uh, to it was like if after uh, before monsoon uh, 
it was like uh, they uh, my mom is miss my mother and my grandmother uh, granny used to store dry fish because uh, the sea used to be stormy and you can't go to the uh, uh, ocean so this was kind of uh, uh, food security and uh, i felt that i have good attachment because my mom's uh, herself sold uh, dry fish my parents both sold dry fish for more than 35 years uh, so drawings you see uh, they are not related to recipe like uh, in, uh, ingredients used but uh, they are more uh, about uh, uh, what is going on in the city the flux which is going on the city and uh, i didn't do drawings earlier these kind of drawings this is this this is this these kind of drawings i started first time in for this uh, book actually next slide so uh, we did mummification of uh, the fish which was cooked as a recipe in which the, uh, the fish which was used in each recipe so there were 11 to 12 uh, means there were more but uh, uh, we did mummification uh, next slide so i applied uh, uh, a secret material i can't tell you now <laughs> so they just then they just uh, <laughs> uh, wrapped uh, uh, lenin to it but uh, here the problem was that way we speak about the caste system uh, past all panels were speaking so these roti uh, making women were uh, actually miss roti making job was was seen as very low job in koli community and uh, uh, i i really feel, felt bad because uh, because of this project they got elevated and being sculptor i feel that uh, how sculpture here uh, it can work actually that that uh, experiment uh, really worked and they are now proud like means next slide so this is the outcome uh, this is video or just yeah. next slide so we uh, uh ju uh, miss ju uh, local jurors uh, juried it and then uh, winners were an announced and we gave them money for materials and also remuneration next like this is our final outcome of the sculpture next so i collected a lot of uh, objects from river asturi uh, like uh, river creek uh these are the bones uh, leftover bones uh next uh these are crab shells as evidence next sculpture made out of uh, leftover uh, collected uh, from fishing village next oysters from early sea phase next river clay next so uh so in uh, 2019 uh, we uh, started uh, uh, 
Tandil Fund of Archives. And uh, I read, I'll read this uh, text about Tandil Fund of Archives. Tandil Fund of Archives is a socially engaged archives and ethnographic pop-up museum of Koli tribe of Mumbai. We are an open artist collective. The co-founder of this collective are Parak Kamal Kashina Tandil and Kadambari Anjali Mahesh Koli. Tandil Fund in Chendini Koyiwar Thane was founded by Tandil families at the beginning of 14th century to support Koli people economically during their time of necessity. We are resuming this fund in context of pool of archives. Koli tribes are original inhabitants of Greater Mumbai and Mumbai suburbs. Their heritage of seven islands, their heritage on the seven islands span as far as back to Stone Age. Their predecessors have encountered the great regime surge and fell around them, an invasion of colonialism and imperialism. Since thousands of years, Kolis have fished, rowed, and inhabited in these estuarial lands as the realm around them has altered. They are edged by unsustainable infrastructure. These indigenous tribes of seven islands are struggling like the ocean around them because of the ever encroaching megalopolis in their fishing grounds and villages. Sorry, villages. Their rich histories are choking with metropolitan pollutants. Currently, this community is going through the insecurity of post-displacement. There are more than 250 Kolivadas in and around Mumbai. Each Kolivada has its own social and cultural practices. These villages are very much self-sufficient and self-sustaining lands, though city has grown around them. These isolated villages have their own identities in Mumbai. An important part about Kolivadas is they never dependent on the city's so-called infrastructure, basic infrastructure. Kolivadas have their rich natural resources and cultural existence. But in recent times, these Kolivadas are being seen as land of opportunities. These villages are sea-facing lands and others are discerning such lands as prime properties. Can we imagine the fisherfolk community without an ocean front. We are very much concerned about the proper and ethical documentation of these indigenous tribes whose rooted culture is on verge of extinction. Mission statement. Tandil Fund of Archives realized that there is no museum space for indigenous peoples in this megalopolis. Fishermen communities of Mumbai have deeper knowledge of ocean's behavioral pattern Kolis have a, a rich, rich tradition and culture which needs to be documented and archived in various layers. The collective aims to work towards the exposure of the content through public art events in social sphere, which will be in form of socially engaged pop-up community museum. The information collected in the pool will be accessible to public for study, research and interventions. We are, closely, we are closely collaborating with Kolivadas to archive information. Our aim is not just to work on historical documentation, but also to intervene in current times. The collective wishes to serve as an archival, archival tool through which information and narratives to the, of the community can be disseminated through various art forms and act as a living museum of memory. TFA Collective looks forward to, collab to, collab to collaborating with community as well as researchers, artists, and orga by organizing workshops, symposia, research camps, book publications, film screening, and pedag pedagogical uh, conferences that operate in public sphere. So let's see how, where. Next. The first uh, museum we started very close, uh, very closer. Uh, this is uh, Sri uh, uh, Dattatre Mahadev Thanekar, popularly known as Daina. The Daina name was given by uh, Raj Kapoor, who was his great friend, good friend, and who was guru of him. 
and there was lots and lots of documentation we were knowing kadambari and i it took more than 2 years to bring the, that museum to us actually uh, there were lots of family problems and uh, next uh, so he uh, started documenting in uh, 50s and he bought camera first camera came to kolivada in thane and he was a very well known photographer in thane and he documented many various events and uh, uh, at home uh, uh, or changes uh, of uh, there are many uh, uh, nehruvian uh, misunderstood modern india uh, uh, way of attire uh, in kolivada as so next slide he was also a marriage photographer he was operating on multiple level like next uh, so political meetings and he used to his usual uh, workplace was rk studio there is lots and lots of documentation from rk rk studio so we are doing his second museum also but it will take uh, time uh, he had uh, documented lots of objects also which is coming in uh, next museum next so this is the space uh, this is near uh, chendani bandar in chendani bandar the thane uh, the ancient port uh, which we hear and uh, first railway which uh, came uh, that thane is uh, it's near near that station so uh, this is the open space of uh, thane municipal corporation the khule kala dalan uh the kadambari's father's uh, initiative uh, it was it was uh, kadambari's father's initiative next so uh for the while we uh, stopped and then in 2019 uh, we thought uh, uh we should uh, collect words and this was uh, a stories of vanning sound cycle to a pop up museum of uh, uh, a uh, koli community a socially engaged word bank of vitawa kolivada and chendani kolivada this was like a comparative study of two kolivadas uh, next slide so uh, uh, to the uh, left side is uh, chendani kolivada and to the right side is vitawa kolivada when train came whole chendani kolivada was connected to bombay all of them left their business uh, the uh, ocean trading businesses and they started working uh, in the industries and many uh, uh, the municipal corporation was near and uh, they lost language uh, i myself uh, was not uh, was means my granny was speaking my mom was speaking to her but now she, my mom is not uh, she she, she for, has forgotten but uh, before 25 years i shifted to vitawa kolivada which is just uh, in between there is thane river creek and it's kind of a 1 km distance 1 uh, km so one uh, it's, it's kind of 1 1 to 2 km distance there still language is there but they are far from railway station thane station so how railway station is acting that was but still they have fishing uh, 15 people who are going for fishing and whole chendani kolivada is educated and they are not kolis like we are not kolis <laughs> we are educated now <laughs> so these hierarchies are there the vitavas are gauthi means gauthi means they are they 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 do they, do, they are not uh, sophisticated means these people are more sophisticated uh, chendani kolivada people so how these uh, means if you speak in koli language then what happens with Uh, he is not he is not sophisticated so there there are groups they uh, which have formed which is very interesting uh, to see next so we did uh, museum in uh, vitawa kolivada i stayed there in 20 uh, uh, there for uh, 25 years and before that i was staying there before that i was staying in thane thane is my uh, chendani kolivada is my my native but we uh, we shifted with our colleague for for other reasons some reasons and i got to know many uh, differences 
so we did uh, this uh, word bank we called all uh, shahirs there are a lot of uh, lot of uh, folk uh, singers uh, we invited them and uh, we extracted words from the uh, extracted words from the next slide so they shared their 15 15 poems and uh, 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 we extracted words from them and uh, later what happened many people just started dropping uh, their poems many people uh, write means the koli people if you see they, they there are a lot of people who write uh, poetry and uh, mostly uh, women also but women is more they uh, they are more uh, they, they they have oral uh, uh, tradition so next slide so first day on inauguration of the museum uh, we uh, arranged a, a performance of uh, folk songs and uh, poetry reading and uh, next slide so one of the fishermen came and he started uh, talking to us and uh, he gifted us uh, these fishing gears so there are a lot of different different fishing gears in that side which is estuarial side of thane so you will not find this in kulaba or this western side these fishing gears next so one of the uh, other fishermen uh, gave us this uh, uh, sorry the title is uh, <laughs> so baskets which are kept uh, uh, which are kept uh, means fish fish is stored in which uh, it it and uh, these are the different names of the fishing nets and baskets next yeah yeah so we arranged the dry fish competition and we extracted words next uh, there was film film screening next so after uh, covid uh, during covid we started publishing books of folk singers this is of ramesh nakwa next and this is of uh, damodar uh, shibu koli next and we are also uh, 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 we have started a uh, waxing livelihood to help koli people for new occupation we have started uh, one program uh, which is which will run for two years this was the first uh, first uh, project uh, next from uh, year 2021 we uh, declared uh, first september as koli heritage language day thank uh, next this is the last slide and uh, average price per square feet plot in mumbai is 26 to 35000 and what is the price per square feet for ocean so this is the end slide and thank you Uh, thank you so much parag uh, for your stories of loss recovery resilience uh, and you know a kind of reconciliation uh, in your own community through so many projects that range from art to uh, festivals and so on uh, i think we should uh, i would request our last presenter uh, now uh ratish to please make his presentation thank you um good evening i think uh, i must thank uh, ranjit and ravi for thinking of me and um asking me to participate in this panel um i was very interested uh, uh very excited in fact to um read how this was conceived and uh, you know the panel will reflect on how groups and communities reorient their relationship with place and change in the midst of epic upheavals of ecocide runaway urbanization 
infrastructure monopolization of vulnerable landscapes with implementation for architectural practice, as well as the question of habitat, labor, livelihood, and culture. Um, so I, um, I was kindly introduced uh, um, um, to, uh, as, um, as you know, I've been working for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture uh, for some 25 odd years. And we've been, we've been working in India for about uh, 15, 15 years. And, uh, you know, this whole question of nature heritage, livelihood, nature heritage community linkage has been quite uh, central to our work. And, um, um, and in that sense, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that we thought about quite a bit um, in that, um, um, sorry, this is not what I wanted to share. Um, um, so, so what I'm gonna do is show you a lot of uh, pretty pictures. Uh, I'm gonna ask the same question that Prem and Anupama asked is, can you see my slides? Um, can you see the Humayun tomb up there? Yes, no, no, yes. Yes, we can see it. Great, thank you, Prem. Um, I am not going to be a patch on any of my three predecessors who uh, were very scholarly in their, um, in their presentations, uh, very gravitas. Uh, I think at the end of the day, I'm allowed to add a little bit of lightness before we get into a discussion. Um, so this is this has really been our uh, field of work uh, for many years. And the problem, and you know, it's very exciting that we first got engaged uh, at Humayun's tomb in 1997 as a gift of His Highness the Aga Khan uh, to restore the gardens. I'm talking about nature, unfortunately, this connect between heritage and nature is it's just so absent in India that it's shocking. And it's more shocking because uh, we as heritage professionals um, need to piggyback on the, uh, on the nature movement. I know many of you will disagree, but, uh, but the ecological, ecological movement, the green movement has so far been able to uh, bring a lot more people on their side and understand the issues than heritage professionals or heritage agencies in India. So for us, in the heritage side of thing, it's very important to piggyback on nature. And many, many, many of our historic sites in the country um, have vast spaces of green that could be used uh, to restore landscapes, plant trees, rainwater harvesting, uh, and all the right thing. And these can have significant urban impact. Um, it was in the 1970s, it was early in the 1970s that His Highness the Aga Khan felt the uh, need uh, to concentrate on public open spaces. And uh, uh, he was at a conference and, in Cairo and was told that Cairo has enough open green space to really, uh, for each citizen to put their foot on the ground, which is the case of most of our cities, sadly. And uh, he requested for space to build a park. And al Park was built on a garbage dump. Um, in the process, a 12th century wall was re revealed, which was buried in the garbage, 700 years of garbage. And this park is today more visited than the pyramids in Cairo, which is, which is something to say. So this really inspired us at the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. And for almost uh, three decades, we've been looking at this nature heritage um, bridge link in all our work that we do everywhere in the world. I was very privileged um, to serve seven, seven years in Afghanistan, in Kabul. And, uh, and uh, you know, in, from 2002 onwards, and this, this was this was the only remaining Mughal garden, um, and um, this was the state of it. Every tree had died; existing trees had bullet wounds. It's almost as if a madman had gone through Kabul with a machine gun and for hundreds of years, and you could still see the snow. So this was 2002. Uh, 
we removed three tons of unexploded or three truckloads of unexploded ordnance from the garden looked at archival material where you know this was really jannah this was paradise and tried uh, this is a landscape design by professor mohammad shahid we put in about 3 and 1/2 thousand trees in the garden restored the archaeology and uh, from you know from from a municipal park it became once again jannah and the impact of uh, on the life of people as a result of this thing was shocking um we we've still had even to to date to date we have about 25 to 30000 visitors a week and uh, so these are just some before and after pictures these trees have now grown these are all the panja chinars that were planted back collected from the countryside over 300 saplings of 19 fruit trees that babur had clearly mentioned is in his diary he lies buried there and uh, you know it was incredible to be Adam teased if there is any such word in the park. Uh, these are just ple- peach blossoms and, and so on. Now um, and and you know these are these are uh, not small areas. The Bagh-e Babur was almost thirty acres, as is Humayun's tomb, the Garden Restoration. This was put on the. This is very critical to, I believe, what what today's discussion was about. You know the state of nature because when the site was. put in the world heritage list unesco no less asked the government of india to fix the gardens to restore the gardens and that's how we we were brought in um we restored flowing water uh we realized that this was part of an ensemble of gardens uh, until the 19th century when urbanization took over uh did a lot of archival research this is a photograph from 1842 and came to this incredible again jannat paradise garden the earliest char bag now the mughals really had their homes and gardens everything happened in gardens like this there were no palaces in the european sense and it's lovely to have the oranges back in uh, uh, you know fruit uh, in humayun's tomb the last two months it's been closed to the public and it's incredible how much orange is just lying scattered on the ground um and you know um we found wells dug wells rainwater harvesting orchards of lemon and orange um growing well and and you know this two pictures and prem has probably seen this picture before it's my favorite before and after picture um this is what it was and this is what it became um when when it was like this it used to get 160000 visitors a year and when it became like this it now has 2 million visitors a year so clearly people have a hunger uh for public spaces that that help them connect um to to um somewhere deep down within themselves um and since um um we came back we came back um, so we had started at humayun's tomb doing a garden restoration and in 2000 <clears throat> the then prime minister requested further public private partnerships in heritage and we specifically looked for sites where we could improve the quality of life um, harkat mentioned you know the quality of life in the koli community and for us it was very important that wherever we do our work would uh, in heritage would lead to a much better improved quality of life for local communities it would lead to creation of a city park and of course conservation of a grand one so we we since then again conservation itself has many answers to what we're talking about today uh, materials we use are um, you know in that sense um, you know green materials much more than uh, just any other material that's got from the earth that like anupama was talking about so um, but again you know at sundar nursery itself there were 22000 square meters of road network within the park we had to dismantle all this create 8000 square meters of road network and and you know create a nature culture hub i mean this is not but we have over the last 20 years planted 20000 trees in this 200 acre vicinity of humayun stone sundar nursery and now the ecological impact of this will be seen many many years later but 
for a site that was not open to the public, we have had 600,000 visitors last year. Uh, again, Sharif Sahib was the landscape architect for this paradise garden. That was, it's a new garden, it's not a restoration, but it does look at all the principles of Persian gardens, flowing water, fruit bearing trees, geometrical layout and flowing water. Um, which is which is which is key to almost everything we do. Uh, we were able to remove about twenty acres of encroachment and restore the land and the monuments and the green space um, to the people of Delhi, which I think is one of the most important things we've done here. This was really twenty acres of stretch that was best used, and this is this is what's become of. Uh, what was earlier Malba dumping grounds. So if you do a project over, over almost 15 years, um, you can actually have the impact of all these trees really growing up and looking like, so we've become a victim of our own success in many ways, people filing RTIs and in fact, EILs to uh, protect this biodiversity zone without realizing that this is a created wilderness, more uh, towards allowing children and school children to understand Delhi's ecological system than to make a dent in climate change and so on. We have been able to address uh, 15 of the 17 sustainable development goals through this project, um, but um, you know, this is the landscape philosophy of the landscape architect, Professor Shahir, but we've had over a hundred bird species come back. We've had butterflies, it's become a hotspot for dragonflies and um, this is of course pre-COVID, uh, but this is how we hope it will be used both for heritage, ecological and cultural awareness amongst school children. We're doing a lot of work with other like-minded organizations, bees, organic farming, and so on, uh, which is critical. And, uh, uh, you know, but the work, I mean, what I'm trying to demonstrate from this conversation or this presentation is how many different ways um, heritage, nature, urban, historic fabric can, can be intertwined and our interventions can be a plus, plus, plus on the heritage, culture, ecological sector. This is a historic step well, 14th century collapse. Uh, we were able to relocate all of these people, build them alternate households, um, clean, almost 60 feet of um, accumulated, whatever this is called, with buckets, and um, you know, make a major impact on a very important sphere. I mean, 12,000 people a day pass through the Bauli to go to the Saints Darga. Uh, similarly, we found that 1% of the people in Nizamuddin had any access to public parks. And, um, um, you know, we are also trying to do a health program and education program and so on. And all of these people had no toilets or no sewer line connections and were dumping their waste onto the Nala. We, for, for about five years, removed 400 to 500 truckloads of waste every year till we were eventually be able to, with five years of effort, huge community involvement, uh, create a green space, uh, link 200 plus toilets to the sewer line. Um, and you know this this was a project that was very important to us, but it's really about how nature and urban transformation can go together. And for this, we needed to establish a waste collection program. We need to get children involved. It was, and similarly over here, you know, parks converted to human uses. Um, finally, you know, we're trying to do a similar similar effort in. Uh, uh, in Hyderabad at the Golconda Fort, again, a site of urban proportions, 106 acres with 100 monuments set amidst enclosed gardens, which nobody knew of till we started interventions. And, uh, and so this is, this is another one of those. So it's become a template for us across the world. We're doing heritage, nature, ecology over here. When we started, it'll be very, you know, I say this with, with, uh, you know, I mean, it gives me great pleasure to say this. When we started the conservation effort in 2013, we were buying water, buying water 
to in tankers to really fix historic buildings. Today we have one and a half crore liters of surplus every monsoon because all the blue spots you see are historic wells which we repaired and desilted and graded. Um, so you know this is how it was in 1991. This is what it's become. Um, so this is the kind of context in urban cities that we have in India, where just in 20 year period, it goes from here to here. And, um, you know, the urban fabric is just taken over and hemmed in the site. So these were landscape studies that Professor Shahid did, the green spaces, circulation, uh, slopes for water and so on. And, um, and, and we've got, again, We've already planted 10,000 trees, and by the end of the project, we would have planted 20,000 with ecological buffers on both the northern and southern side of the site. And you know, this is this is the impact of this. This step well itself has about 35 lakh liters of water, but it needed 400 cubic meters of uh, stone. And these are some of the fruit-bearing trees that that we planted. And this is this is the reason why we work in uh, urban spaces and and green areas. <clears throat> um, so it's, it's uh, and, and this is the first time that one is really formally talking about the nature heritage uh, connect in our work. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's been across the world, what we've been doing is not only livelihoods, not only quality of life, but also, um, also to create open spaces which have uh, in, which, have, which are designed for people with very diverse, uh, diverse uh, interests. So thank you uh, for listening to me on this one. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Ratish, for your presentation and uh, showing us some amazing transformations. Uh, And I welcome you all now back for a conversation on the various uh, points you have raised, but would also like to take you back to the uh, original intent of this, uh, of, of this round table, so to speak, which is the idea of reorienting group relationships uh, with place and change. Uh, I have some questions just to start off, if you don't mind. And I would like to start with Ratish, who made the last presentation, and ask you a little bit about, uh, maybe you can tell us some anecdotal uh, uh, kind of stories about the ways that communities that uh, were within these sites, uh, how have they uh, looked at the work that you have done and uh, if, if, if they have, how have they benefited from it? So, you know, uh, uh, again, one of the reasons we chose to come back to Maestro uh, after sort of the question was because of the presence of a community that, was, that had deep linkages with the, with the heritage of the area for seven centuries. And, uh, and also was equally uh, a needy community. Um, in that sense that, that we could do multiple levels of interventions. So um, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a journey because uh, we spent the first few years trying to understand the community's needs. And while some things were obvious, other things were not. So we've had, um, we've had uh, you know, multiple interventions that have ensured that the community benefited. And this is before we started any conservation work. Because when we started, there was a DC deputy commissioner of the Municipal Corporation of Delhi who styled himself on Mr. Jagmohan and uh, had these ideas from 1970s development in America. So he had gone to the community and said, uh, park hai, main makan banaunga, aur makan hai, main park banaunga. So he had told the community that, you know, he will remove all their houses and uh, build multi-storied ghettos at the edges of the settlement to relocate all of them. And the Aga Khan Trust will come and do that. So we really started on the back foot. But, um, uh, you know, but we, we built a school 
um, we have a polyclinic that has had over 600,000 individual patients. We've done the urban improvements in terms of street paving, in terms of you know housing improvement. We really try to understand and very, very, um, you know, in a very systematic manner, what were the community aspirations? We, we realized that waste and uh, garbage was one of the primary problems. Uh, so in that sense, almost 100% of the community has benefited from one program, the other, whether it's health, education, creation of open parks, whatever. But what is critical, you know, if you'd asked me this question four or five years ago, and we've been involved for 15 years now, I would have struggled for answers. But the really happy moment came when we finished Hermione's tomb, the conservation of Hermione's tomb, and members of the community came up to us and said, you know, we're very impressed with what you've done. And we'll be very grateful if you take over our principal mosque and fix it. Now, this is not a protected monument. So, um, and we've done that. We've so far, and that's the earliest sort of mosque, 14th century building that has been restored in India. So that was, that was one thing of how they have perceived uh, the program. But also, I think in many ways, our focus has been the women. So we built toilets for the women, we built parks for the women, we did livelihood programs. We realized that less than 5% or 9% of the community youth had any sort of vocational training. So a lot, some of them have got involved in the conservation effort. Other people have done computers and software and hardware repair and become electricians. and salesmen and so on. So um, change in this sort of community takes a generation, but you know, we've, we've been there almost 15 years and a lot of impact is felt. About 15 kids from here have gone to American universities because 400 of them were trained in English. Um, so I can go on and on, but in the nutshell, I think uh, we've been able to benefit almost 100% of the people who live, which is about 20,000 people. Uh, through the Sundar Nursery development, we last year had about 600,000 visitors. So impact is Delhi-wide. And at Humayun's tomb, I think we get 2 million people from across the world, at least till pre-COVID. So, so in the impact on, uh, on people and uh, from across the globe uh, is felt by different parts of what we do in, the, in a historic city center. Line. Uh, this is from Latika regarding the encroachments uh, in the Sundar nursery. Uh, where were the people sent to? Also, do entrance tickets end up excluding large sections of the people in Delhi from accessing these public parks? Yeah. So um, um, this was there was no people or people. Uh, the encroachments were not people. They were institutions. So there was a club uh, with a you know swimming pool and all of that. In 1989, um, the Sundar Nursery, portions of its land were given to uh, the monuments around the monuments. The ASI land was given to uh, Bharat Scouts and Guides for a six-month camping uh, camping program in 1989 called Bharatiyam. There was an architect called Anil Lal who built temporary geodesic domes, about 150 of them. And they were supposed to be dismantled after six months. But what happened is after Bharat Scouts moved out, uh, people connected with Bharat Scouts continued to stay in, continued to build. So there were no people uh, who were, uh, no poor people or so on that were moved. Um, in terms of entry tickets, um, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's it, there are many ways to answer that question. But the entry ticket is, uh, 40 rupees, it, uh, it, uh, I don't think 40 rupees excludes anybody. There is also for the local community, uh, a, a subsidized annual pass of thousand rupees for the whole year. You can come in and go as you, must, as you please. Um, and, but what is critical is that we're trying to over here, create a new model where public spaces are not created only by government and not maintained by government. So not a single penny of your tax money uh, comes into the maintenance and operations of Sundar Nursery. The entrance ticket is 
by far not enough to maintain Sundar Nursery, uh, which is still being subsidized by us. But sooner or later, we will break even and reach financial sustainability in operations. So the money and funding that was spent is a gift and a grant, but, uh, uh, but the ticket is very well considered. It's not uh, unpriced. Un I would also like to uh, uh, talk to Parag about his uh, experiments. I think these are very unusual ways of, uh, you know, engaging communities and artists and a sculptor uh, figures out ways of engaging communities, his own in this particular case. Uh, what has the reaction of the communities been uh, to the, uh, to your interventions, that is, one question and the other question is the more you know real difficult and uh, uh, problematic kind of situation where most of the sea edges are no longer now very accessible to the Koli community thanks to you know mega projects like the coastal road and so on. So can you tell us something about the direct impact about these projects? on the uh, on the Koli communities? Good question, actually. Uh, first thing, uh, when we started, so it was like, uh, uh, everybody was like, uh, why you are doing this? And slowly, people started coming and then they started uh, realizing that what we are doing and we have gone very, very deep, but people, means, uh, because of Ravi's uh, curation, the first time Kohli Museum has come to City Museum, and that is very, very, <laughs> so uh, it's like, uh, it was, yeah, and uh, means, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, it's like uh, honor for them and uh, so one of my friends said garva se bolo koli hai hum <laughs> so that was like a uh, good thing for uh, both of us and uh, about uh, environment uh, you know we'll talk about i'll speak in a very short because uh, uh, it's very huge we believe ocean is not ocean. Ocean is our God. Large fish are our lar gods. We don't catch. Tortoise is God. Turtle is God. It is forest for us. Forest within forest, forest within forest, and forest within forest. That's what we believe. There are micro forests in ocean. Second thing, uh, when you destroy uh, the first part, first, first 100 meter off uh, Bombay, uh, so any, any uh, uh, shore, there is a cycle of laying eggs and there is, there is kind of a pyramid which is, uh, uh, is the natural pyramid which is disturbed, which is very much important. Is we have lost best oyster patch of Worli, which my wife loves to explore. We actually go to hunt for her, to, for, to hunt oysters there. And before it was closed, uh, Kadambari and I went for uh, hunting. And you can find those for photographs on Instagram. And she loves oysters. Like, it's fascinating for us. We live in Bombay and we know here ocean is there. And we know we are surrounded by forest which is not seen. That is more important. Means we have lost uh, Rawas, uh, means there is a fish breeding ground. We have lost uh, in this coastal road, uh, largest 
शेवंडीला शेवंडीला शेवंडी लॉबस्टर ग्राउंड मीन्स लार्जेस्ट लॉबस्टर ग्राउंड मीन्स इट वॉज नैचरल ब्रीडिंग ग्राउंड विच वॉज नॉट डिस्टर्ब मीन्स इट वॉज इट्स लाइक इट कीप्स ऑन ग्रोइंग इट्स लाइक फार्म इन द ओशन नैचुरल फार्म इन द ओशन इवन ऑइस्टर इट इज फार्म इट वॉज फार्म नैचुरल फार्म एंड नाव न्यू पॉलिसी लाइक न्यू गवर्नमेंट पॉलिसीज रिसेंट आई गेट लॉट्स ऑफ वॉट्सअप मैसेजेस आई है आई हैिग आर कैंड ऑफ दैट लाइक न्यू फिशिंग पॉलिसीज एंड न्यू पॉल फिशिंग पॉलिसीज आर लाइक they want to start caged fishing and what will happen they, they they have first of all it was earlier it was very like we used we used to go in 100 meters you will get good fish 2000 you will earn when in one day you will earn 2000 for one hour you travel uh, drop the net early morning you go 530 next day 2000 rupees ka fish milega so this is the way it's very good ground means this whole 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 seven island is very nice but they don't understand you have to stop building that is the one but those areas are lost here. no that is more important those areas are lost no yeah we have lost all all those things mm-hmm. yeah thank you means yeah uh, thank you uh, it's great to hear the sea called as a forest you know uh because then that that gives us a completely different way to look at uh the concept of the sea that is just outside uh our just just touching our shores uh i have a, a question for anupama uh where uh you have put forward through your presentation a series of propositions but i would like you to kind of you know maybe give us some uh, specific examples uh to uh to to explain some of those propositions especially the idea which you put forward that architectural imagination must transcend design and enter the realms of material science and economics i think that uh if you can give us specific ex- examples from your own practice uh it would be very interesting um with images or just describe okay so you know um since i think what has happened is that since industrialization the there are so many automatized um, things that unconsciously prime our decisions i would like to use stress the word prime i think uh, in school we at least in indian schools we still i don't know whether they still teach mecha or not but you know we we know a little bit about how things get constructed you know but often i have noticed that you know i would like in in countries where like and, and especially in the de- developed countries where somebody is making all the decisions we don't even realize what is the to the extent to which economic factors drive decide decisions i would like to mostly because it's very technical actually this answer that when i say we have to go be, beyond uh, the typical thing that the designer did uh, because architecture used to be a um, custom made service and not a mass production thing so i think there is this kind of disconnect uh, i would like to use the example of the lego toy which many of us in india had the good fortune not to play with uh, i would like you know like i've seen in europe people have been playing with lego so already the the pixel that they are assembling is a um, is based on a module that they never question they only do what they can assuming that the model the module is a god given fact like gravity you know and then they try to see what is possible to do within that but today's lego toy and i had to notice this with my children who were who were i was raising over here today's legos are not like a specific block that you build anything out of with one lego toy that you buy you can only make that car you can only make one engine and the the, the girl who will sit there as a figure human scale 
will wear pink and the boy will wear blue and if, if it's a nurse it will be a pink clad person and the doctor will always be a boy and all those you take in so much you get so primed you know so what i'm trying to say is that today if you want to make a real change in thinking we need to be able to think that there is there are other ways to build than and there are other ways to play than lego so lego today makes so the child believes uh, there's a delusion that they built that car but somebody else designed it they think they designed it and a lot of architects think they designed those buildings which somebody else actually designed the components and we ordered those components from a uh, from a, some catalogs and you start thinking from there so i feel what i meant is that in order to really make be like an architect we need to go into other areas than what we are calling design to we should know about economy we have to know about other larger big picture issues in those realms uh, you know decide those real questions which are the problems we face otherwise we don't have the guts to question the assumptions and we keep on within it we do little bit every year and then therefore our architecture came down to what the elevation is like how the rendering looks and all those things because in reality we may think we are designers but many of us are puppets i don't know if this answers bit of a contradiction okay. because the points which you have just made would also apply to uh, say some of frank gehry's very early work where he did use his imagination to transcend the standard materials and formalist practices of his time so there is also a question of scale i think mm -hmm. which uh, which very clearly you practice a certain scale as opposed to some of the the other architects i wonder whether you would like to comment on that okay yes i mean i'm often uh, asked uh, especially when i am based in the west here so called you know they have always ask this is all good but how are you going to scale it and i think the way to scale an architecture practice is to actually not uh, uh, scale it in terms of how many how big is the practice how many numbers of employees you have because i do believe in the human scale after a certain scale you cannot you don't know your employees and the question is everybody can decide if they want to have that life of uh, anonymity or not i chose not to have that and i think for me the way to scale up this is to have the same model of very many small studios up to 15 to 20 people and there are projects like airports and certain things where you need large offices but uh, just because you need those for the big some of those type of programs that should not become the norm i also have the feeling the same like the starbucks versus the regular cafe guy you know even in a place like france where everywhere there is a coffee shop uh, and everybody does a custom made coffee uh, if you go for starbucks it's in the end we thought that kind of economy of scale will be cheaper but it's neither cheaper the starbucks is more expensive uh, it's just that you're paying a lot of money and much bigger chunk of the money goes into managing the enterprise globally and very little of it goes into the actual coffee and one thing is that intelligent people like the same people who know how to make coffee are excluded or if they are given jobs because they don't know how to run their practice anymore they work for starbucks now and those people you are get you get paid to not to think you're not allowed to give a different coffee you know your customer wants one dose of sugar instead of two but you can't do that you have to ask we are because, what i'm questioning is the systems we choose then they make us uh, we become tools of the tools we created and if we submit to that then we are we are all employed in um, big offices but there is a pyramid now we are employed to not think at the lower level but human intelligence in my opinion is widespread it's decentralized everybody actually has it there is a control freak nature of believing in the big practice and i think there are economic drivers so i'm studying much more about economy now since quite a few years because how do you talk about circular economy and all those things without talking about economy and talking about specific examples i mean all my research with ferro cement and things to do with cement are an example are examples of how 
uh, I actually am challenging some of the uh, blind habits. Uh, you know, just because more people do something is not right, actually. It doesn't mean it's right. We all know that. It's true now that we think the mainstream wants something, so it must be right. But we all know that 100 people lying doesn't make it a truth. I feel. The same vein, I would just uh, like to take the uh, argument to, to frame when you, you, of course, talk about practice. Uh, in a text which you had shared earlier, you talked about two terms which are, I think, very significant. Uh, one is non-linearity and the other is emergence. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit about both because they seem to tie in quite well with the presentation you had made. Yeah. Uh, uh, a, a linear system is where there is a relationship between input and output. A large input will produce a large output and vice versa. But in non-linear systems, and climate is a non-linear system, uh, it, that doesn't necessarily happen because you can have a small input producing a large output. And um, Edward Lorenz, one of the pioneers of complexity theory in climate studies, uh, coined the word the butterfly effect, that a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil will call a, cause a typhoon in the Philippines. So, I mean, that's exaggerating to make a point, but, uh, and systems are non-linear because they are emergent. Emergence is the capacity of a system to hold fundamental properties that did not exist in an earlier state of the system. And uh, one, one of the classic examples in, of emergence is a termite's nest. Uh, which has wonderful planning. It has climate control, functional zoning, uh, garbage disposal, and a lot of things you'd expect in a perfectly planned city, except there's no master plan or termite. And the way it works is that termites, as they move, they exude a, a type of chemical called a pheromone. And the termites that follow can uh, uh, sense the pheromone trails of termites that are moved before. So there are actually a set of very simple rules. Like if you smell a pheromone trail like this, then put a piece of mud like that. And, and it's from there that this complex evolution just builds up. It's actually the way the traditional city developed. We have, we have cities like Jaisalmer or you overseas, you have cities like Siena, which, which didn't develop through master plans. It's just there are a certain set of rules through which they develop. And it's the way we intuitively live, but it's not the way we are schooled. For example, friendship is an emergent process. You don't find friends by first constructing a philosophy of friendship. In fact, if you try that, you probably wouldn't have any friends. You, uh, you find friends by just spending time with them non-judgmentally. You listen to them and you find resonances that the same things make you laugh or cry. And then suddenly one day there's friendship, which is the core of your relationship, which didn't exist at the first meeting. So uh, my interest is actually the practice as an emergent space. So uh, to identify emergence and how do you respond to that? Um, I, I, I relate to Anupama's question of scale that it's, it's, it gets dehumanized if you're running large teams. So we run the practice as a network of small teams. Each team is uh, so far has not grown more than about 10 to 12 people. And, uh, but the idea is to run a practice where the dialogue between these teams um, is, is what drives the energy that because we're sharing issues, we're sharing, we're asking the same questions, we're learning from each other. So a certain emergent culture will, will evolve. It's a very slow and uh, rather patient process that one has to invest in. So I see myself as actually not a designer in the primary self, but sense, but a designer of a design culture where um, my role is to drive the patterns of cross recognition between teams and to try and pick up a meme from one team and sow it in another team. And, and then to see, to, to, to nudge that in a certain direction, but not to control it. Uh, so uh, that's the way uh, I look at practice. I think I, I always felt that 
we have not looked at the issue of practice. It's, it's a very poorly conceptualized and researched term. It's just something that feel happens automatically. And we just... Yes, the basic model. No, it hasn't uh, because, because we, haven't, we haven't researched it. So we just have two, two models. One is the business organization and the other is the creative personality. Hmm. The per creative personality is seen as the cutting edge. So uh, the way I like to put it is we only think about the practice of architecture, but we don't think enough about the architecture of practice. Right. Uh, early in your presentation, you uh, said something that sounds a little counterintuitive when you were talking about uh, planetary scale ecological loops. He, you said that there is a need to constrain economic growth. Could you uh, tell us what you mean by that? Uh, what I mean is that if everyone uh, in, in this globe uh, adopted the same consumption patterns, uh, we'd need six planets, which we don't have. So, so we need to change the, uh, the current uh, a large part of the world has already got set into a pattern and uh, even uh, countries like India are seeking to emulate that pattern, which is to uh, raise economic growth and therefore raise public welfare. Um, a large part of it doesn't work because the trickle down effect, which is supposed to lie behind that, that idea doesn't, and we're actually just increasing inequality, which is problematic. So I think as Kate uh, Rayworth, an economist said, we, uh, we have an economy uh, that must grow whether or not we thrive. When we need an economy, in which we thrive whether or not it grows. And uh, she comes up with this principle called donut economics, uh, where the inner ring of the donut is a set of social welfare indicators below which we must not fall. And the outer ring of the donut is an ecological threshold we must not cross. And, and you try and run your economy uh, so that it always stays within the ring of the donut. Uh, so it's just been an idea, but it's beginning to be implemented. Last year, the city of Amsterdam declared that it was going to run the city on the principle of donut economics. And uh, I, I don't know, if I, I would be a little careful about saying that we need to study economics more. The problem is, uh, and I think Karl Polanyi uh, sort of articulated this quite clearly uh, in the 1940s, uh, where he said markets and society have existed together for centuries. But what is new after the industrial revolution is where prior, prioritized markets above society. Society is supposed to adjust to markets. Whereas earlier society was prioritized above markets. And that has created what he calls fictitious commodities. We, we treat certain categories as though they're meant to naturally exist in markets, whereas actually they're embedded in, in much deeper networks. So, uh, so life gets reduced to labor. And if there's no demand for labor, lives don't get recognized. Or land is reduced to an asset and its deep uh, connections with memory and with uh, ecology, all of those get lost and get externalized by the process. So, so we really need to fundamentally rethink that whole worldview. May I add uh, please something here? Uh, you know, because we Okay, I want to use, uh, uh, you know, what Prem just said to kind of actually, I think uh, exactly along those lines, but I want to specify also what I mean differently about economy and the fact that I'm seriously studying this quite a bit. I'm teaching about circular economies. And for that, I realized that the architecture, architecture students don't know enough about economy. In, and I'm trying to explain these things to them and learn it first myself in non-money terms, you know, not it's just to understand it from the point of view of human activity and what we exactly how do we exchange resources basically whether we exchange our own labor or our work and everything comes down to energy human energy or any other energy to extract a material it can also be human energy the moving of the, the material is anyway there the molecules get moved somewhere so what energy goes into it and what implication those decisions have, whether you negotiate human, uh, man-made or machine-made and so on in every context. So from that perspective, 
I would like to add to this whole thing about the six planet thing, because I was also, I started out thinking that we have to really cut back and, you know, on how much we are spending. And then I realized that actually, if you don't look at it in money terms, there is a question of how you see philosophically scarcity versus abundance. If I live within my means, then it is sustainable. If I were to do, if I, go, it's a very common thing. I mean, basic thing. If I design houses that my, the, the, my labor, what I do in a day is not going to generate enough to produce enough surplus that I can spend that. So, you know, those are the type of questions I found out. And therefore I came to the conclusion that the Starbucks coffee versus the local cafe or other such decisions of scale, just like right uh, how Parag also explained, you know, the local community and the local knowledge, which is not necessarily in a university or school, that, that cannot be brought by a global chain person, the years of knowledge. And if we want to go that way, to have these large supply chains and the big company, it comes at an enormous cost. But that doesn't mean that to be sustainable is so expensive just because if, if you just do it the simple way and believe deeply that every human being has the same intelligence or potential to be intelligent, it does not have to be organized in this pyramidal way, everything. That's what I'm discovering. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks, Anubha. Uh, it was... It's all of you, uh, Prem and uh, uh, Ratish, it was very nice uh, and uh, like learning, good learning for my, because I am sculptor, by, I learned sculptor, uh, like graduated sculptor and then architect, uh, architecture and sculpture was not, even your material uh, uh, culture uh, way you thought, but uh, I feel that uh, Koli people uh, are still minimalist, minimalist, I think so. It's they are happy in their environment. They are not going to Starbucks coffee. <laughs> Though they don't need a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> and they are living uh, in uh, still, still uh, is like since Stone Age. Like, and that uh, means way you said compared with Starbucks and uh, local coffee, like, I'll tell you one thing, the new uh, UBC Insta on Instagram, I'll finish fast. Uh, <laughs> we see uh, on Instagram, we see an uh, ad of new fish, uh, uh, packed fish, but it is raw. So, and uh, that, XYZ companies have got equities, foreign equities, uh, huge money they have got. And uh, they have bribed the uh, state government. And uh, now what is happening, the fishing women, our women's uh, markets are there in Mumbai and they are uh, kind of uh, removing all those markets. But problem is that Kohli women will give you a 100% good fish, fresh fish. Otherwise she will dry it. Leftover is dried. Bones are eaten. Bones. But if you see the meat selling, fish meat selling companies, they will remove meat and bones will be thrown off or they are like, they are again recycled. Then they, they want their, their fish to look good. So they will add, apply formaldehyde. So this is the difference between buying fish from local community. So that's what I'm saying. But you have to pay more to the uh, um, uh, company who is selling fish and women sell according to the market rates. That's all, yeah. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, I think, so we can have questions from the audience. Uh, please ask Hello. your questions. Hello? Is it on? So thank you for that uh, wonderful discussion and unpacking of, especially like Anupama's 
idea of the Lego and the categories we are thinking and the way Prem opened, opened up the idea of creativity. Uh, I just want to tell you my experience with urban spaces and nature that uh, there's a constant conflict between the built environment and what is left unbuilt, which you know is commonly called as parks and nature. And there's a constant desire to put those open spaces to use, otherwise they're left, they're considered unproductive. So you want to make them into parks or you want to make them into uh, some kind of um, outdoor activities, you charge them. And then there's a conflict between the idea of the commons and the private and the public. And these are conflicting values which are very much driving how urbanization takes place. And the reality is there's no city, there's no space which is un unoccupied. So anything which you want to create has to be created because uh, uh, it, the, the public space, green space, is never unoccupied. It has to be created like that. And then there's so, sort of uh, many contest, contesting claims on that space, including by the state. So the, the actual dynamic in an urban space and, and green space is very, very complex. And it always goes towards the idea of, uh, uh, you know, the economic output. And increasingly, uh, you know, and we're seeing this around the, around, uh, around the, uh, around the cities in the country, that these spaces are now meant to be put to use. So whether these are natural spaces of waterways or of parks or of forests, there's a constant drive to put them to use of some sort, make them into amusement parks, make them into ferryways, something which changes the nature of things. So what was earlier a public park, that concept is not existing anymore. And the state seems to have a different role in in this idea of publicness of space itself. So I don't know what you, what you think about this, this kind of reality of, of urbanization. And when we talk of climate change and nature and keeping things green. So if I could respond to that. Uh, I think the problem is in the way we imagine the city in India. We don't imagine it at all. Uh, we locate culture in the village and uh, or in traditional communities that are somehow preserved the village like character within the city. And we look at the city as a purely technical entity. Uh, you see that in the way building bylaws are framed in almost all Indian cities. They're just uh, sort of a formula derived from the width of the road, the land use, the size of the plot, etc. And the notion of the specificity of a neighborhood or of a topography or of a local history within a very small area uh, it's never thought of in those terms. Uh, as a result, we create this paradigm of, you know, a certain kind of construction as the impulse towards modernity without looking at how many people it serves. And if you look at the urban planning paradigm, uh, something like half the city's population in many cities, even more in Mumbai, it's about 55% uh, operate in spaces outside the paradigm of urban planning. Uh, they're able to function because urban planning is weak and that gives them the space for the informal systems of tenure by which they're able to survive. But the pressures to increase the reach of urban planning are there. There's a middle class pressure, say, which is aspiring towards a global city and say, let's make the city more clean and ordered. Uh, a lot of resident welfare associations are mobilizing accordingly. So we're on a collision course and the contestations of space are going to get increasingly violent. We are already seeing the, the signs of that violence today. So I think we have to see the city in terms of human rights and the right to the city. Uh, it's quite mind boggling that we run paradigms of master planning that ignore half the population or more and leave them to their own devices. In fact, we effectively criminalize them and render them permanently vulnerable as a result. So, um, it's, it's going to require a popular movement of some kind, uh, which is based on the right to the city. And given that this is going to be India's urban century, where for the first time we'll have more people in urban areas than in rural areas, um, I think how we envision that right to the city, how we imagine the city as a cultural and political space will determine whether we sink or swim 
and and we've just got climate change as a whopper on top of all of that. Um, so so it's it's quite a serious problem. It's uh, it's it's quite scary, and um, I think we need a popular mobilization on this issue. Uh, would anybody else have a question? Uh, are we okay for time? Yeah, Parag, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's my question to uh, Prem and, and Anupama. Uh, uh, do you think that it is uh, when you plan a master plan, this large city, uh, it is responsibility of uh, architect for everything, not just to build and then people will come to stay or reside there or occupy that space, live in that space. But trash that produces the city is responsibility of architect. If Charles Kodia would be there, I would lo love to ask him that whole new Bombay's trash which is produced, or whole city's trash, which is produced, which is, which is dumped in our lands. My aunt has 176 square kilometers of land in Thani, to Bhandup, and her whole land is like, that's 176 acres, but like some of the acres are being occupied by these dumping grounds, and that is huge is issue. And these are becoming a mountains, huge hills, and they convert them them into later gardens. So, and the smell, which is it's kind of violent process. Do you think that architects should think about this also? I would like to. Should I? Can I go first? Yeah, um, please. Uh, so I really like this question. I have asked myself this question throughout myself because I grew up in Bombay and then I lived in smaller places also. And I think uh, I've always wondered how much an architect is responsible, how, what is the role of a vision in, in human settlements. And I often compared a lot uh, other colonies like the termite colony that uh, Prem mentioned, uh, you know, bees, uh, birds, and they construct their own homes and animals who need a shelter, they do construct it with whether it is a spider or a termite or a, a, bee, or a bee, we with secretions from ourselves, our own skill and our own whatever material you find around with that we create habitat normally. And even humans did. And I think, and in, in fact, in my exhibition at Louisiana, I had a section called the architecture of time, which I divided into um, the architecture of matter, of mind, uh, of, um, of matter, of life, and of mind. Because over time, time is the architect, and over time, matter, like stone, it forms in a certain way, it becomes round if it rolled down rivers over time, and whatever. And, you know, then uh, um, life has its own architecture in our body, in our cells, there's an architecture, and all geometries coexist. And as over lifetime, they evolve over time, they change. And then when architecture is outsourced with the mind, I have that section on the humans where we started by making bricks and so on because a human being, it managed to stand up on two legs and the two hands became redundant. So we started to make things and then we made tools where first manufactured material was a brick mold with which we made brick and that made us think in a certain way. Or then we every tool we made, it made us into something, our brains got bigger, all that whole evolution thing of humans. So if you look at it from that perspective, I think that the, it, the, the answer to your question for me, whether the architect is responsible and to what extent, has to do with the human scale. So as long as we build, if you had to do a termite colony, which is beyond a certain scale, or the birds, or even the beehive, you will see that the small bee colonies and the big specifically have all of this as exhibits, live exhibits in Louisiana. I had brought 
uh, a bird nest, the same species who built with horse pony uh, hair, the same skill with a different material because it was around them, and the same bird species with the same skill but a different material that they found slightly different locally. And I don't think humans are so different from that. But the, the answer is when the habitat uh, goes so much beyond a manageable scale that the humans can manage without architects, that's how the architect uh, became important. And in the older cities, I had the very good fortune to work with Roger Angers, the chief architect of Auroville for 17 years. And because his city was envisioned to come back to the human scale, not more than 50,000, very compact high rise because in India, we are uh, one sixth of the global population on 2.4% of the world's land. We cannot, we have to be compact and we cannot build towers uh, uh, without knowing about that. The, the same uh, common man will not have the overview. So, and it's not only the architect, but it's whether it's an economist or whether it's an anthropologist and whoever thinks about it and the philosophers and all together, whoever has a vision, they, we need the vision. This is my opinion. Today we need, vision has a very important place because we have to reimagine the human habitat because if we go by the common man's capacity, we will do urban sprawl, which is what we have in India. And then we, uh, we will have no land left for the ecosystems. Because if you have to build everything with the local technology, you will spread. Now, if you go high rise, you have the other problem that th these towers don't integrate. So the human scale, how to have high density. And this is what Roger Angers actually imagined for India, uh, sorry, for Auroville in India as a, the project that the mother had imagined for India was to address the complex urbanization problems of India in a high density model but low impact city, very small, many cities. Unfortunately, that uh, could not be applied uh, because people built the green and then they, they didn't want to build the city uh, to some extent. There is a resistance, you know, towards it. But the vision is important. I do feel that if you're talking about, we've gone out of that scale, urbanization will make or break how we manage. Our cities are unlivable. We, I all the more uh, have faith in architects, but not alone architects, but we can't manage this huge transition without. Yeah, thanks, uh, Anupama. I'll, I'll put it in terms of four categories. One is the whole pattern of waste generation. Uh, we are, are moving, we've unfortunately been on a trajectory where we're moving more towards centralized production, which requires large, uh, uh, extent of plastic packaging and that generates more waste. I, I think the example you gave is, is exactly the right one that the fish you buy from the Kohli community versus the fish you buy from a large meat processing company. Obviously the fish you buy from the Kohli community is a process that will produce far less waste. So, so one is we are looking at supply chains that are waste generating and that's one thing that we need to change. Uh, the second is the need to decentralize the process. Uh, we, we, there's a movement going on in Bangalore that uh, we're creating uh, problems by just centralizing the whole waste disposal and therefore we go to centralized landfills which raise the kind of uh, problem that you mentioned in Bombay. And uh, really we should look at uh, handling waste at the ward level. And uh, at that level, you can utilize, you know, you can bring rag pickers into the system, a lot of things that are already happening, you can, uh, so, so we need to, a lot of the waste can be handled and only what you cannot handle at that level should go to a centralized source. Uh, that leads to the third thing that we should operate by what is called the principle of subsidiarity. You should have a decentralization of the city and you should say the lowest level should do the maximum it can and what it cannot do, it delegates upwards to the next level in the hierarchy. Whereas what we have now is top level delegation, you know, top, top to down delegation, where you should really have bottom to up delegation. And um, the last uh, thing I'd mention is that actually there's a problem if professionals intervene too much in the system. Uh, there's a wonderful essay by a planner uh, called John Turney written way back in the 1960s and it's titled housing is a verb. And uh, he says that actually housing, we treat housing as a noun and therefore we make it a product. 
and then we that sets up price thresholds and then half the people can't afford that price and then with the system then can't give them housing but if you say housing is a verb it's a process by which people can gradually improve their lives then you you realize that self help incremental housing can be part of the model and in fact where you give them security of tenure and allow them to do uh, stuff on their own and you know minimize the level of professional intervention just to where it's needed you get far better quality of housing and i think that question applies to a whole lot of things whether it's waste disposable or disposal of uh, whether it's many other things just taking care of neighborhoods uh, when people have affection for the street when you plan a neighborhood so that people have affection for the street they live on then the street will be kept clean we plan cities so that we don't build those bonds of affection so so uh, people's participation is actually crucial uh, we we look at master planning that's uh, just delivered to the people and we treat the people as passive consumers uh, it should be a process that encourages this level of participation we are uh, up for time and we need to kind of end uh, this wonderful session uh, i would like to thank all our uh, panelists uh, parag ratish anupama prem thank you so much not only for your presentations but for all your insights uh, it has given us a lot to contemplate and i hope that conversations like this uh, will continue uh, in in other fora as well uh, thank you to everyone here and online uh, it has been a very enriching evening so uh, with this i think we can end the day today thank you so much thank you thank you